So yeah, my name is John Weiss. I am an education specialist from the Marshall Space Flight Center in Huntsville, Alabama. Uh, and we're going to be talking a little bit about lunar exploration today. Please feel free at any point as I'm going through. If you have a question, throw a hand up to stop me and we can, I'll take questions. I'll also take some time at the end to answer questions. I'm pretty flexible either way. Uh, but I don't want to lose anybody as we're going through all of this. So feel free to do that. <coughs> so we start with uh, the moon, exploring the moon. Uh, one of the first things that I always ask people, and those of you that have been in my stuff, you know I do audience participation occasionally. So my first question is, when was the first time we sent something to the moon on purpose? The 60s. The 60s. That is a reasonable guess. He says 63. He's going to narrow it down for me. When? 82. A little earlier than that. It was actually in the 60s uh, range. Actually, turns out the very first time that we sent something to the moon on purpose was 1961. That was the Ranger program. Uh, we had decided by this point that we were interested in maybe sending people to the moon. We'd already decided at that point we wanted to maybe do that. But we realized that, to be perfectly honest, we didn't have a lot of good pictures of the moon. We're talking, you know, late 1950s technology. Yeah, we could zoom, but that's a long way to zoom in to try and get good pictures. If we're going to send people, we need to find where it's flat enough to send the people where it might be interesting enough to send the people. We don't want to send them somewhere and just you know, hit, hit a spot where they're closed. You know, we want to catch what's going on. Uh, so we started trying to get better images of exactly what the surface of the moon was going to look like. So we started sending the ranger probes. The ranger probes, basically, the way that they work to get better pictures back then, what you did was move closer. So we launched a probe at the, sur at the moon. And as it headed in, let me see if I've got a laser. Yay, I have a laser. OK, so it has <laughs> cameras down at this end, radio dish to send the information back to Earth, rocket at this end to accelerate towards the moon. The closer you get to the moon, the better the picture is, the more resolution, higher resolution, more detail that you can see. One slight problem with that, the words at the bottom. <laughs> if you're heading for the moon, from Earth, you have to be traveling at least 11.2 kilometers per second. That is relatively quick. So to do that and then hang a left right before you hit the moon, not going to happen. So all of the images from Ranger actually are slightly marred in that right where that crosshair is, there is now a small debris field that used to be a Ranger. Uh, so while it's an interesting way of imaging the moon, not the best way to image the whole moon. Especially not if we want to land people there, because then it turns out that all the spots that we've imaged have a small debris field, and you can't land on top of the debris field. So we had to come up with a better way. Plus, by 65, we had astronauts that were possibly volunteering to be those people going to the moon. They were a tad nervous about the fact that everything we'd sent to the moon had impacted the moon at high velocity. They were pretty much not interested in that mission. So we needed to prove that we could both land on the moon more gently and at the same time that we could get good pictures right at the surface without just slamming into it. So we moved to the Lunar Surveyor Lander series. Uh, we landed a few vehicles on the surface of the moon. The nice thing about these is that they had a mast up here with a camera that could be rotated around. So we could take multiple images. We send those images back to Earth. They print the images as pictures. And then in the Photoshop, I know this is going to be weird for some of you younger people, but there really was a thing called the Photoshop, not just Photoshop. It was a warehouse with big white tables and lots of good lighting where they would line up all the pictures and create a larger panoramic picture of what the lunar landscape looked like, which is why you see these sharp edges here. Those don't actually exist on the moon. They're just the edges of the photographs that they made. Now, this is an image of a lunar surveyor lander. It is not, however, a lunar surveyor lander on the moon. Can anybody tell me how we know that? 
the sky is blue, which generally indicates an atmosphere. Very difficult to find on the moon. What else? Yeah. This nice dark line right here we like to refer to as the Atlantic Ocean, also not found on the moon. Anything else? The moon is not orange brown and tan. The film that we sent to the moon from the very beginning was color film. The moon is black and white. So if you see color on the ground, it's not the moon. This actually happens to be an engineering model of the Lunar Surveyor Lander on Cocoa Beach. Well, and that's the other one that most people don't catch on to, so I'm glad you picked up on that. If this was the Lunar Surveyor Lander on the moon, who took the picture? <laughs> Makes no sense to land them right next to each other, so we know this has to be. Actually, this, uh, this is part of a series of images that were taken of that Lunar Surveyor Lander. The first one they could not use and wouldn't let us use for any presentations, because right over here was a young lady in a swimsuit kind of looking over to see what they were doing. Uh, I only saw it because I met one of the engineers who worked on it, and he said all of the engineers who worked on it had a copy of that image, because she wasn't un unattractive. And <laughs> they're like, no, we need our picture of the lander, that's it. <laughs> but we needed to see more of the moon. So we started orbiting the moon. 66 to 67, we orbited the moon with the lunar orbiter. Uh, we were able to image 99% of the moon, almost the entire back side of the moon, the front side of the moon. What we didn't image completely were the polar regions, and this is only because the orbiters, the, the orbit that we put them in, didn't go directly over the poles, so we didn't get to image that part. But from those images, we were able to create full hemispheric panoramas of the moon at higher resolution. We imaged the entire moon at uh, six meter resolution and certain areas at three meter resolution so that we could select those for possible landing areas. Now these maps that we generated from the lunar orbiter uh, are actually the maps that were used to then name all the different parts of the moon. NASA did not do that. That is not our job. There is an organization called the International Astronomical Union and their job is to name things in space and make determinations about what their classifications are and all of those types of things. And it was the IAU that actually did this. They held a special meeting where they took these large maps of the uh, moon, these hemispheric maps, and they came up with the naming conventions that the large semi-smooth areas that we call mare would be named after states of mind. The highlands, the, the whiter, lighter areas, uh, would not, they would be named for various uh, people uh, and some of the craters are named for people depending on what's going on. Interesting thing, uh, one mare on the far side of the moon, or you could call it the back side of the moon, the side that never faces us, is actually named, because mare means sea, so if we write it in Eng English you've heard of the Sea of Tranquility where we landed with Apollo. And th there's one on the back side that's actually called the Sea of Moscow. which violates the rule a little bit. Uh, but what happened, the story behind that is that actually while they were doing this, uh, this convention and they were on the back side of the moon and they hit this small Mari, uh, the Soviet back then, the Soviet delegate asked for the floor and he was given the floor and he suggested the name the Sea of Moscow. And of course everybody, that's against the rules, you can't name it for its in states of mind. And he said, but you don't understand. Moscow is a state of mind. And apparently it amused enough people that it passed. So there is actually a Mare Moscoviense, the Sea of Moscow on the back side of the moon. It's the only one that is not a traditional state of mind. I'm still trying to figure out how that didn't prompt the US delegation to get a New York state of mind in there, but they didn't manage it. Uh, so we're stuck with just the one, the Sea of Moscow on the back side. But once we'd established all the different parts, we'd named the parts so we knew where we were going, we then had to decide where we were going we decided to land near the equator on the side facing the Earth. We needed the side facing the Earth for communications. On the equator just gives us better lighting. And so that's what we decided to do. And we moved into the various programs, specifically the project that 
took us to the moon. Anybody know the name of the project that took us to the moon last? Apollo. Apollo. Okay. So we had the Apollo program. Now we started with practice and orbit. Before we landed on the moon, we actually went to the moon twice without landing on the moon. So we first started with the command module just in orbit around the Earth with Apollo 7. Then we moved to Apollo 8 where we took that command module all the way out to the moon. This is not the path they took. That's the 8 for Apollo 8. Apollo 9, we practiced with the lander and the command module docking and undocking around Earth in case we had problems. And then we moved to Apollo 10 where we did that same practice, docking and undocking, but in orbit around the moon. Now, interesting fun fact, little backstory things. See that flame right there on that patch? That's the only flame that that ascent module could ever have had. Uh, that is the ascent module. The lander feet would be at the bottom when it went down. We leave the lander part, just take the top part back up to the command module. Uh, but they were not given any fuel in their ascent module. They were given a mass equivalent to the fuel. I believe it was actually ping pong balls because it has roughly the same mass as the fuel we used. Uh, but they were told in no uncertain terms, you guys don't have any fuel in your ascent tanks because headquarters knew these guys. All of the astronauts for the Apollo program were fighter pilots, test pilots, push the envelope kind of guys. And headquarters was pretty sure if they had that fuel, Apollo 10, which was not scheduled as a moon landing, would have been a moon landing. So they didn't give them any fuel. And they told them, you don't get any fuel. So because they were a little cranky about that on their mission patch, because the astronauts get to design the mission patch, they put a huge flame underneath their ascent module because they were sure that it was going to, at some point, it was going to need flame. So they put it on their patch. Now, I will tell you, before you start feeling too bad for these guys, in later interviews, every one of them was asked, if you'd had fuel in the tanks, would you have landed? And every one of them answered, yes. <laughs> so don't feel too bad for them. Headquarters knew what they were talking about. Uh, but that led us then to being able to land. Maybe. Here we go. So <clears throat> this is footage of the second man to step onto the surface of the moon. You'll understand why I know that for sure shortly. Uh, but just a quick thing I want to point out. In a minute, you're going to see he gets to the bottom of the ladder, but he's not actually at the surface yet. And so he's going to jump down to the surface. He's still not on the moon at this point. He is standing on the foot pad of the lander. He's going to practice jumping back up. Missed. He's got to try again. It's a three foot jump. Wearing a full spacesuit. Now, yes, he's on the moon where gravity is six times weaker, but that suit on Earth is about 250 pounds. It was not light. He's still not on the surface, but you're about to find out why I know this is the second guy. Because if it's not, he's about to be really surprised. There, he just stepped onto the surface of the moon. Now, why in the world would we make the ladder three feet too short to make it to the ground? We didn't. <laughs> they did. I know, no, that sounds a little strange, but here's the thing. The lander was designed such that we were supposed to use fuel, or the astronauts were to use fuel to get about 10 meters from the surface and then cut the engines and let it just drop. We put crumple zones on the legs that were designed just like a car's crumple zone to absorb the energy of impact and crush down, which would lower the bottom of the ladder down to the surface of the moon. But I described these guys. What were they? They were fighter pilots. They were test pilots. Crashing, not so much in their repertoire. So every one of them, every mission we had, they landed under fuel. They used the engines and just cut the engines back further and further until they actually landed. Fine, but that means the crumple zones don't crumple. And so you have a three-foot jump to the bottom rung of the ladder. 
because you refused to crash land, even though we told you to. That's why they had to do that. But we thought there was a chance they would have to do that. So before they could go on a mission where they were supposed to land, they had to prove to NASA that wearing that suit, they could jump that high on the moon. So what they did was they put a suit that was about a sixth, they actually put a backpack on them that was about a sixth as heavy and made them jump six inches onto a step, just holding on with one hand on the wall. And they had to be able to jump onto the step repeatedly and then actually go running for a little bit and come back in and jump up on the step the first time to simulate having gotten a little fatigued from walking around on the moon before they could do that to prove that they'd be able to jump up to that bottom rung just in case it didn't crumple or they didn't crash land. Turns out that was a good idea because they refused to crash land. So the mission's where we actually landed. We had six missions that we landed people on the surface of the moon. Apollos 11, 12, 14, 15, 16, and 17. Yes, I skipped one. It was supposed to land, but it didn't. It had problems. We'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, but in all cases, all six of those, three people went to the moon. Two people got to go down to the surface. One person got to be the world's loneliest person. Although they weren't on the world at the time, but still. Uh, because <laughs> they were as far from the Earth as anybody ever was. And when you're on the far side of the moon, you can't talk to anybody on Earth. It's not that it's a rule, it's just line of sight is required for communication and the moon was in the way. So for about 22 minutes, they were alone, as far away as you could be. Their options were to look at the surface of the moon or look out into space and realize just how far away they were from anything else. Uh, all of them indicated that they got a little nervous around minute 21, and if nobody answered them the first time they called as they came around the edge of the moon, they got really nervous until somebody called back. Uh, but so we walked, we spent about a day and a half on the surface of the moon each time and then got in the ascent module and headed back up. Reconnected with the command module and then that all comes back to the earth, splash down in the ocean, get a big ticker tape parade, have lots of fun. Except for Apollo 13 with the famous phrase, Houston, we have a problem. What happened with Apollo 13 is on the way to the moon, there's a procedure they needed to do to refresh the air in the capsule. Because there's only so much air you can carry inside the capsule. By the way, the Apollo capsule, this room here, you could fit at least three, possibly four Apollo capsules in this room. They got to spend three days going to the moon in it, three days coming home, and then one guy got to spend the extra day and a half just orbiting around in it, where he had lots of room to move around. Um, but they had to carry spare air. The way we carry the air is we super cool it, compress it down to a liquid, and stick it into a tank as a liquid. Unfortunately, we cannot breathe it that way. We call that drowning. So we need it as a gas. The way they make it a gas is they vent some of that liquid into a mixing tank, paddles spin around, warm up the liquid until it becomes a gas again, and then they vent the gas inside the cabin and they have fresh air. They were doing that process when an external overpressure valve failed catastrophically, which is NASA talk for it blew the mess off. And when it blew off, the gas that they'd created decided to leave through that hole because physics works everywhere. And because physics works everywhere, when the gas left that way, it pushed the vehicle that way and started into a spin and pushed it off course. Yay! So the astronauts, now this is the impressive part to me. The astronauts immediately recognized something was wrong. That's not impressive. Anybody would have noticed they were suddenly spinning. But they immediately jumped up, grabbed hold of the controls for the maneuvering thrusters and started working to stop the spin very, very calmly just started doing their job. There were alarms going off all over the place in Houston. People in Houston were losing their minds trying to find out what's going on. They're hollering up, you know, calling up to the, the capsule. What's going on? The guy who was talking to the capsule or talking to Houston at the time, 
is the guy who was on the Jets. He at one point just reached up and flipped off the earphones so he could concentrate and another astronaut grabbed the earphones and put them on and started doing the talking. They got control of the spacecraft. During that event, none of the astronauts' pulse rates got higher than 1.25 normal resting ro pulse rate. At Houston, three people were treated for their hearts were racing so fast <laughs> that they needed medical attention. The astronauts, now, 10 minutes after they had control, all of them spiked to double. <laughs> but they concentrated during the job, just did the job, and then they worried about it. Unfortunately, in doing that, they used up all the maneuvering thruster fuel, or a vast majority of it, which meant that when they got to the moon, they did not have the fuel necessary to dock and undock the lander and the ascent module. So instead, they had to simply go around the moon and then head on back home. Everything's cool, we're heading home, yay! Except partway back home, they realized that the carbon dioxide filter was full. The only spare carbon dioxide filter they had was for the lander. It was the wrong size and shape. So they had to build an adapter to fit the new size filter into the old size filter spot. The fun part of that is engineers on Earth had to figure it out first and then communicate it up to the astronauts without pictures. The way we set the communications up for those missions, we had two-way voice, we had one-way video from the capsule to Earth, not from Earth to the capsule. They didn't have a monitor to even look at them. So they had to write the directions and couldn't say, like this. They just had to write directions and have the guys build it. They did a good job. They actually, well, <laughs> we brought them home, alive even, which was a bonus. Now this is also a picture of what I refer to as the luckiest unlucky or unluckiest lucky guy, I can't decide which way I want to say it, in the Apollo program. One of those astronauts, a gentleman by the name of Frank Borman, is the only Apollo astronaut that went to the moon twice and did not get to walk on the moon. He was obviously supposed to walk on 13, but they didn't get to land and walk. Uh, I say he's the luckiest unlucky guy because while he didn't get to walk, he got to the moon twice and I have not yet been. And I think that's terribly unfair. But we'll get beyond that eventually. Now, it, it is true that in an, in an interview later on, somebody actually asked him if it was disappointing to go to the moon twice and not walk on it. And this was proof, his answer was proof that he should have been an astronaut and I probably should never be an astronaut. Because his response was, well, imagine as a child if your parents woke you up one morning and said, hey, get in the car, we're going to Disney World. And they drove you from, he was, at the time he was in uh, Michigan, he said they drove you from Michigan all the way down to Disney World and you got to the parking lot of Disney World and they said, okay, we've been to Disney World and turned around and drove home. Would that have been disappointing? At which point the interviewer said, yeah, that was probably not my best question, was it? <laughs> See, my answer would have been something to the effect of, were you dropped on your head today? <sighs> but he did a nice job with talking about it. So we studied the moon. We landed on it six times. Twelve men got to walk on the surface of the moon. Twenty-two people, twenty-two men orbited the moon. Apollo 17... Our last lunar mission became our last lunar mission for one main reason. We answered our last question. The only reason we got to go was we had questions about the moon that we needed people to answer. The last question, anybody know what the last question was that we needed an answer for? Yes, sir? Is it possible we can live on the moon? That's a wonderful question, but it was not one of our questions. <laughs> Oddly enough, that was not our, we were pretty sure we'd be okay with that, but that wasn't a key question that we were studying. I wish it was, because we were planning to now. No, it, it wasn't water. We were actually, they were so positive there was not water that they weren't even checking for it at that time. That's a reasonable question too, but not actually, you ready? This is, this cracks me up. The, the question that we needed to answer, the last question that we got an answer for was, 
Were there actually volcanoes on the moon ever? And the answer is yes. There were once volcanoes on the moon. And the reason we got that answer is because during the Apollo 17 mission, they found orange soil, which kind of, okay, they found orange soil. What's that mean? Turns out actually what happened was as they were doing a spacewalk, collecting samples, one of the things that's really cool about lunar regolith, that surface of the moon, the powdery surface, is the edges are very jagged. So if you compress it down, it locks into itself. And so the footprints that the astronauts left on the surface of the moon are most likely still there unless something hit in those spots. And I mean the defined boot prints, not just a depression, but the actual tread markings are still there. They thought this was really cool. So quite often as they're walking along, they would just take a step and then kind of move back and look at their boot print. And oh, that's really cool. Well, one of the times he did that and he stepped back and the instep of his boot print was orange. So I called down to Houston, uh, Houston, uh, just looked at my boot print and it's, uh, the instep is orange. The immediate response was, will you check your oxygen mix, please? <laughs> my oxygen's fine. It's orange. So he calls over the other spacewalker. This is part of why we send two, so they can check up on each other. Calls him over, he looks down. We have a, a wonderful audio clip. There's orange soil. To which the response was, well, pick it up. <laughs> so they scooped it up. They put it in a bag. It was an unscheduled sampling. Uh, but when they brought it back to Earth, they found out the reason it was orange was that it was actually not soil, not regolith, but pyroclastic glass rich in titanium. And titanium crystals are orange if you let them get large enough. But that's not the important part. It's that it was pyroclastic glass. The only way you can get pyroclastic glass is to have a pyroclastic volcanic eruption. It's the rules. You can't get pyroclastic glass any other way. So if there was pyroclastic glass on the moon, there were once volcanoes on the moon. We answered that question. We had to stop going to the moon. Yes, sir. It sounds like they discovered that accidentally. They did. Was there an intentional plan to try to discover if there were volcanoes? Their intent was actually to characterize craters, smaller craters, because there's, if you're on site, you can actually tell the difference between an impact crater and a volcanic crater. And so they were doing a survey of craters to try and establish if any of them had all the signature marks of volcanic craters. So yes, they, they were in, and they didn't actually find any. <laughs> that showed the right characteristics or all of the characteristics necessary to say for sure. But they did find the glass, so they, had, they were able to stop looking. Yes, sir? Why was that an important question? It gives us an idea of the history of the moon. Because the moon is too small, as far as we understood it, the moon was too small to have volcanoes. To have a molten core, to have a molten mantle, to get volcanoes, you need something fairly large for gravitational heating to keep it warm. The moon isn't big enough for that. What we have figured out since uh, that point is that it actually turns out the way we got the volcanoes is very large impactors that when they smacked into the moon transferred so much energy that it actually melted some of the mantle, the basaltic mantle, and that generated the volcanic eruptions, uh, both fissure cracks and pyroclastic volcanic eruptions. Uh, but it gave us an idea of the, the history and how the moon formed and a better understanding of, of what was going on at that time. At this point, we believe the moon is just solid frozen through. Uh, it's just not big enough to hold. It doesn't have the, the characteristic magnetic fields to have or to indicate it's liquid anywhere. Uh, so we're pretty sure it's solid through at this point. So the next time that we send something to the moon, we didn't even really send it to the moon. The Galileo probe was just on its way by it passed the moon in 1990 and 1992 on its way out to, anybody know? Saturn. Jupiter. To, uh, to look at the, the Galilean moons of Jupiter. So it had an instrument on it called a mineralogy mapper. The idea was it looks at the reflected light, determines the chemical composition based on the spectral analysis. Uh, so we said, you know, we're passing by the moon. We might as well turn on the instruments and just see if they're working. So they did, and we get this nice false color image of the moon. This is a false color image of the moon. The moon should look like this. 
if you step outside and the moon looks like this, you need to cut back. Okay. This is false color. We added it in to see the different minerals. It should look like that. But one of the interesting things was it indicated free hydrogen radicals, which are associated with water ice. So they actually thought the instrument was not working properly because we know there's no water ice on the moon, or at least we thought we knew that. So then, a little bit later, 1994, we sent the Clementine mission. Also not a mission to study the moon. Bizarre part here, this mission was sent to the moon because it was there. <laughs> it was really a testbed mission to show 14 different new technologies and prove that they worked. Uh, so they just put them all on one spacecraft and said, okay, we need to send it somewhere. And somebody, well, how about the moon? Okay, we'll send it there. So they sent it to orbit the moon. We showed all the technologies worked. We got these beautiful images like this of Aristarchus Crater. False color image again, not black and white, so it's false color. About two months in, they sent a command to have it fire its maneuvering thrusters and change its orbit. And we lost, con lost communications with it. We believe what happened is actually that one of the fuel tanks had cracked and leaked out one of the hypergallic fuels uh, so that when we tried to ignite the engines, the fuel, one half of the fuel was on the outside, the other half was in the combustion chamber and leaked to the outside and then met the fuel and reacted and that's not generally a good thing. Uh, so we think that's what happened. We won't know for sure until someone goes back to the moon and finds debris and can bring it home and we can look at it for sure. Uh, but it stopped talking to us. That's all we really, really know for now. But during the two months that it worked, one of the instruments, the one that gave us this cool picture, indicated the presence of free hydrogen radicals. NASA does not believe a whole lot in coincidences. The fact that we found two different devices that indicated free hydrogen radicals made us start to wonder, maybe there's water ice. So we sent a mission to find out if there was water ice. Lunar Prospector in 1998. We went back to Ranger concept. Let's smack the moon really hard and see if any water ice comes out. Because we thought it was maybe subsurface. So this big old spike here was actually fired at the surface of the moon. What we established was there was no water ice within two meters of where we impacted. But they thought, you know, this isn't the best way to check the whole moon because, you know, that's a lot of prospectors we got to send out there and then we junk up the moon and we can't land there anymore. So they had to come up with some other ideas. Uh, it took them a little while to come up with something better. We came up with the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter. June 17th of 2009, it was launched to study the moon. At this point, 2009, we had decided or been told that we were going to go back to the moon and send people back. And we wanted to learn a little bit more about the moon. So we sent the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter on the same vehicle. We sent the Lunar Crater Observation and Sensing Satellite, or as we call it, LCROSS, because nobody wants to say Lunar Crater Observation and Sensing Satellite every time we talk about it. LCROSS launched on the same time, or at the same time, on the same rocket, the same Delta III rocket. Uh, so the idea is, with this, was we wanted to see how big an impact makes how big a crater? Because we know the moon still gets hit by things, and if we're going to have people spend long time on the moon, we'd like to know what we have to do to protect them. So would the astronauts. They're really fond of that idea of us figuring out how to protect them from things hitting them. So we had two options. One was ring the moon in satellites and wait for something to hit it naturally and hope that we catch it with the camera, or we can just hit it ourselves and we'll know how big it is and how fast it's moving and then we can look at the crater. So that's what we went with. Sort of the concept of I'd like to know what's inside my computer. Let me throw a softball at it really hard and see what comes out. But it works for this. It's not quite as sophisticated on the inside. Uh, so on uh, October 9th of 2009, what we did was we accelerated the third stage of, actually it was a Centaur rocket, I'm sorry, not a Delta rocket, the third stage of the Centaur rocket, and we crashed into a crater on the polar region, south polar region of the moon. We chose the south polar region actually because somebody figured out, hey, the one spot we really haven't looked for water ice is the polar regions, and they actually have spots in some of the deep craters 
where sunlight never makes it to the bottom. So there could be water ice, maybe. So we chose one of those craters, a crater called Cabeas A. And October 9, 2009, we impacted crater Cabeas A with the third stage of the Centaur rocket. It hit right about there. Well, that's a blow up of this area, but it hit right about there. What you don't see in this image, because this image was taken with the following, the LCROSS satellite or spacecraft, but LCROSS impacted right about there. Because again, it's really hard to hang a left. And the idea was we were actually flying LCROSS through the plume of debris that was ejected out by hitting it with that third stage of the rocket. This was supposed to be visible to the naked eye when it happened. Now it happened at about 4 o'clock in the morning central time. I know this because I was standing outside with binoculars looking at the moon at 4 o'clock in the morning waiting to see this plume of ejecta. Turns out it was brilliant in the infrared. It was not visible. <laughs> so I was standing out in the cold of October 9th at 4 o'clock in the morning so that I could find out you can't see anything. Uh, but the really cool thing was when we passed through that debris cloud and analyzed it real quick and sent the information back, we found water ice. We expected to find enough water ice that if we had collected it and melted it down, we could have filled a, a water bottle, your standard water bottle. What we found was there was enough water ice that if we had collected it all and melted it, we could have filled a five gallon bucket. This is really, really exciting because water ice on the moon means we don't have to carry water up or as much water up. Water is one of those things that if we're going to send people, we kind of need it. People are very fond of having water. So fond that if you don't let them have it for three days, they tend to die on you. So we like that. Plus, if you have extra water, you can break it down into its constituent parts, hydrogen and oxygen. That oxygen stuff is kind of, we're fond of that too. We, we like the oxygen stuff. The breathing thing is really cool. Nine out of 10 astronauts refuse to work if you don't let them breathe. The 10th one just passes out. Um, but also, the hydrogen and oxygen are rocket fuel. So we can refuel rockets from the surface if we can mine that water. So there's lots of really cool things that we're interested in, which has set us up for we're going back. A large part of uh, NASA's exploration campaign, now called Back to the Moon and On to Mars, which is a direct offshoot of Space Policy Directive 1, signed by President Trump in 2017, December of 2017, says that we will develop an innovative and sustainable program of exploration and begin with missions beyond low Earth orbit. Well, the next place to go beyond low Earth orbit is the moon. So we're going to do that. 2020, we are going to send an Orion capsule, the new crew capsule. We're going to send it without a crew but we're going to send it to the lunar vicinity in 2020. That will either be done on an SLS, which is our new heavy lift vehicle, or they're talking about now maybe possibly trying to accelerate uh, the timetables a little bit and actually sticking that onto a commercial vehicle, a commercial heavy lift vehicle, as we're continuing our checkouts of the SLS to maybe launch a little bit sooner. We don't know whether that's going to happen yet or not. If it goes on SLS, it'll be somewhere around June of next year that we send that mission. And then by 2023, people back in lunar orbit. And the late 2020s, somewhere in the range of 2025 to 2026, we're putting boots back on the surface of the moon. Okay. To do that, we're going to have to do a few other things. We have a plan. We always have a plan. So right now we're here. We're capable of sending robots to the, to the moon and onto Mars. We're working with commercial launch vehicles, bringing those up to spec to take uh, human beings on commercial vehicles. We've got two different companies that are doing that uh, or working towards that. We're also building, as I said, the space launch system. This is our new heavy lift vehicle. It is the largest, or will be the largest, most powerful rocket ever created. Uh, in its small configuration, the first configuration, what we call Block 1, it'll be 326 feet tall. 
and capable of carrying 70 metric tons into space. It'll actually be capable of taking 45 tons to cislunar orbit or to, to translunar orbit, which is a lot. Can you put that in terms of what we saw with Apollo? It's about 17% more cargo capacity than, than the Apollo in its small version. Uh, to give you an idea in, in terms of the, the mass that we're talking, we use this, I, it's I guess just fun to use this, but that 70 metric tons roughly translates to 12 adult elephants worth of material. Uh, Apollo was closer to eight to nine elephants worth of mass. And the space shuttle was actually more like five to seven elephants worth. We still haven't sent an elephant up, but we use that as our measurement. Um, we're building the Orion spacecraft. This is a joint venture between NASA and international partners. We're bu we've built the actual Orion capsule and this piece that's hooked onto the back of it uh, that is additional power and propulsion was built for us by the uh, European space agencies. Uh, so they're, they're working with us to do this because it's expensive to do this, so we have to work with partners. Uh, so we'll do that. We're also working on this, we're going to start working on this. It's called Gateway. It is an orbital platform. It is not a space station, although it will have living space and laboratories on it. It will not be manned continuously, and it will not stay in a single orbit. It has a, a new propulsion system called solar electric propulsion, uh, what we call Hall engines. So it takes xenon, ionizes the xenon, and then uses electric fields to accelerate xenon ionized xenon particles out to provide thrust. And it will be able to move around and pick where it is over the surface of the moon. We'll use that as our gateway, which is why we have the name gateway for it. So the Orion capsule will go to gateway, and then they'll either use a lander to go down to the surface of the moon and back, or they'll transfer to a larger vehicle and go on out to Mars. That's what we're looking at right now as our, our infrastructure. But you can expect that by the mid to late 2020s, we have boots back on the moon for long term, long duration, investigations. The last time we went to the moon, we stayed for how long? Pop quiz. About a day and a half. That is not a lot of time. We did not stay long enough to dig through all the regolith down to the bedrock. We didn't even get, we weren't even there long enough for that. We're now talking about missions that are possibly six months on the surface of the moon before coming back up. That should be enough time to dig down through the regolith. It's anywhere from two meters to 20 meters thick, but if we pick a two meter spot, we ought to be able to dig two meters in six months. If we can't, then the astronauts have been gold bricking. So we're, we're pretty sure we can pull that one off. But again, we're gonna do that. In order to do that, we're gonna need the new vehicles. So this is an artist rendition of the SLS, the Space Launch System, in the Block 1 configuration. This is a crew configuration. You can tell that by the pointy spike on the top. That is the launch abort system. That launch abort system we're going to be testing this year, uh, in April, May time frame. We're going to do a, a full test of the abort system. We're actually putting it onto a booster rocket that's being built for us by uh, Orbital ATK. They're going to launch it, and when they get it up to speed, they're going to ignite the separation system, and it's going to yank an Orion capsule dummy off and make sure that that all works before we put people inside. We're very, very fond of making sure things work before we put people into them. So we'll also need, again, that Orion capsule. This is the capsule where the people will be. It'll carry four astronauts for three to four days, depending. Uh, this is the piece that's being built for us by the Europeans. And just to give you an idea of the evolution of that rocket. This is the first version of it. It'll have a maximum thrust of 8.8 .8 million pounds. It'll carry 26 tons to translunar injection. Then we go to cargo form. No people on this, so you don't need the pointy thing. We don't worry about taking cargo off the rocket if something's going wrong. Then we move up to the Block 1B and the Block 1B cargo, and then we move up to the Block 2 where we now jump up to 11.9 million pounds of thrust. That's where we'll send supplies on all the way out to Mars, possibly. We'll be sending pieces that'll land 
uh, be landed on the moon to act as habitats for the astronauts, things like that using the Block 2 and possibly the Block 1B configurations. So at this point, we have time for questions. Any further questions you have? There is no way I've told you everything you wanted to know. Yes, sir. You said at the beginning that the Ranger was the first vehicles we sent to the moon on purpose. Yes. Are there things we sent to the moon on accident? <laughs> Not really. I just like to say it that way to make people wonder. We did, a, we did send a few cockroaches to the moon accidentally, but not on their own vehicle. They just happened to get in. Florida is full of them, and they got in. <laughs> Imagine the surprise of the astronaut as one flew by his. But. Yes? What's the rationale behind a four person uh, capsule? The rationale behind a four person capsule? Yeah. Um, in, instead of the three, it, it really is so that they can work as needed in two-man shifts and give the others a, a full break. Uh, at one point, they were actually looking at a six-man capsule, and they decided, same capsule, but they're only going to put four in, so they have a little bit more room to move around and, and add supplies and things. Yes, sir? Uh, what are the current projects Marshall is working on at this time? What, what are the things they're building? Uh, so the things that Marshall specifically is working on, we are the, uh, the integration center for the SLS. So the whole SLS project, all the different places that are working on pieces, all of those are being integrated uh, through Marshall. So we're making sure that this piece will mate to this piece when we put the whole rocket together down at Kennedy. Uh, the propulsion, the upgrades of the engines for the uh, Space Launch System, we are a propulsion center and that's propulsion research is a lot of what we're doing. Uh, although the, the, Orion, or the Gateway Hall engines are being worked on up at Glenn Research Center, but we do a lot of research with Hall engines. Uh, we're also uh, working right now very strongly in the, it's called the Deep Space Habitat. And it's another option for, we're, we're actually looking at sitting a station or mostly stationary object at the Lagrange point beyond the moon. Of, at that point of, or orbiting around that point of gravitational stability uh, as a long term, this is where we'll build the bigger rocket that goes, or the bigger vehicle that goes onto Mars. Uh, so we're doing the research on that. Uh, we've got two different models that they're building on right now uh, for that. Uh, we also are still doing quite a bit of research in terms of uh, navigational and, and auto automated docking systems. Uh, so we have a, a flat, for, flat floor facility at Marshall uh, that has the world's flattest floor, which sounds a little strange to say, but it's an epoxy resin that the floor is so flat that a human hair on the floor represents a speed bump. Uh, and what we use that for is we put equipment on air pucks so that we can go very low friction and they can be moved around with little puffs of uh, fuel just like we would do in space. And so we use that to test tra targeting and tracking systems. We put them on a, an air puck and let them initiate bursts of compressed gas to move around and actually dock to test our automated docking systems. Uh, it's, it's really, really interesting uh, to see that floor. Um, those are the major projects we're working on. There's a lot more smaller projects that we're also, we're also doing some of the testing of the, uh, the fuel tanks uh, for the SLS, we just put in a brand new test stand uh, for compression test stand for the oxygen tanks that we're, we've got a tank sitting in the stand right now uh, that we're testing. But those are the main projects. Yes, sir? Are there any significant technology barriers that you guys still have not yet overcome in order to Yes. Uh, his question, are there any, still any significant technology barriers that we're working on? Uh, we're still working on a foolproof radiation shielding system. Uh, for going out there because when we sent Apollo, we did not really understand the radiation environment we were dealing with and we actually got fairly lucky that we didn't kill any astronauts while they were up there in radiation levels. Uh, and we know since we're going to be there longer, we need to be better at it. But the, the standard shielding for radiation is really, really, um, it's effective, but it's multiple inches of lead and that's heavy and hard to launch. So we're working on some, still working on technologies that are lighter weight, but still give us that shielding that we need. Uh, we're also, as I said, we're still working on the Hall engine 
perfecting the Hall engine for the gateway to be able to move around uh, at, once it's at the moon, uh, that solar electric propulsion system. It's, we've got it working for small vehicles, but now we're, we're talking about something that's big enough for people to live in, which means we need a Hall engine that works on a much larger scale. Uh, so we, we have not completely developed that yet. Uh, for the SLS, we've, we've pretty much, we're now in the testing phase of the technologies. We've got those developed. Uh, but uh, including, strangely enough, we're, we've now pretty much solidified uh, the technique for 3D printing rocket engines. Uh, we've actually even tested some 3D printed engines and they didn't fall apart, which was good. So we're, we're actually looking at that as a way to, to make them work a little bit, uh, a little bit less expensively use the uh, tax dollars a little bit better. Yes, sir. So the challenges of living for months on end in low gravity, so bone density, muscular dystrophy, all different, are there technologies that are in the future that are simulating gravity? So the, the only ways we can really simulate gravity uh, to overcome that would be to spin. Uh, the problem with the spin is if you're going to spin with people, you have to have a very large vehicle to spin or you have to spin them so fast that they're going to be dizzy all the time. Uh, we're talking a, a vehicle, if you're going to spin and generate earth gravity, you've got a minimum uh, diameter for your spin of uh, half a mile. And that's a big spaceship. So. The other option is to just keep them under constant acceleration, which is wonderful, but you do run out of fuel eventually. Uh, so it, it actually is that if we're putting them on the surface, like even on the moon, we have a much better situation than if we're in microgravity. So even the one sixth gravity, we don't get nearly the same degeneration of bone mass density and muscle density as we do in the microgravity situation. Um, and so they're, they're working with what they can use if they're on the surface is resistance bands and increased weights, increased masses to do lifting exercises, things like that to help uh, retain that. And so we're working with that. Uh, right now it's really the microgravity, that, that trip to go from even the moon out to Mars, you're talking seven months in microgravity unless you accelerate the whole way and again, that's not easy. So they're, that's where they're actually having more of a problem. And we're, we're, we're still researching that. They never quite get back to original uh, bone mass density. If you stay up there for six months, you never actually make it back to 100% bone mass density. You get close, it, it upper 90s. But if you do it over and over, it starts to be a problem. Yes? Actually, uh, so recently China landed uh, like a detector, or uh, record at the backside of the moon. If you see like, some possibilities, maybe for collaborations? We are uh, looking, he's talking about China having sent the mission to, uh, to the backside of the moon. I'm glad you said it as the backside of the moon because it drives me crazy when people say the dark side of the moon. That's not a, th well, it's a thing, but it's not a specific spot on the moon. It changes. Uh, but the far side of the moon, we are looking at collaboration and we have actually, the, the administrator was just over uh, talking with the Chinese Space Agency about two weeks ago uh, at possible collaborations. Uh, and looking at, at how we can partner up and, and bring them on board. The related question that uh, once, uh, once we land someone on the moon, since the time will be like, long enough, like half a year, so I would uh, think they probably have time maybe on, on some vehicle and travel on the surface of the moon, if it's possible, they can circulate the whole moon. How long would it take? <sighs> That's a good question. Uh, so is, he's asking how long would it, if we, just took and drove around the, uh, the circumference of the moon. Right now, the, the vehicles that we most recently used on the moon, which were the rovers back in the Apollo era, they had a maximum speed of five miles an hour. Uh, so you gotta factor the, the circumference of the moon and the fact that you will have to divert around some craters and things. Uh, it's gonna take a while if you do it that. Uh, you can't go a whole lot faster than that because with the one six gravity, if you hit bumps, it tends to launch you a little bit, and it's really hard to steer when the wheels don't touch the ground. So they have to keep it slow enough that the bumps aren't real big bumps and they come back down in time to steer, uh, because there's also no visual references for driving around on the moon. You know, here on Earth, we need to know how far away something is. We have an idea of how tall it is, so the smaller it looks, the farther away it is. 
on the moon, we don't have, <laughs> there's no trees or buildings there to give us a reference. And we, yeah, it's, it's just, yeah, it's, it's actually very large. And there, we had at least one case uh, in the Apollo program where they stopped, they were driving towards a crater and they stopped and figured, well, it'll just be a short walk to the edge of the crater. And when they got off of the vehicle and took three steps forward, they were at the edge of the crater. It was a sharp drop off that they couldn't see from the visual perspective. And they were very lucky because that drop off was about a half mile. And it would not have been able to drive back up. They didn't have that kind of push on that engine or on that motor. But so what kind of majors could possibly end up in a place like uh, Marshalls? Could, could they use accountants? Could they use Oh, yes. Uh, it, it actually turns out that every major that is offered here at Troy could lead to a job at Marshall. Even the education. That's what I am. Um, but yeah, it's, NASA is, is an, interesting, uh, an interesting situation because each of our 10 centers is essentially like a small city. So we have just about every job you can think of, every career. We're, we're obviously at, at Marshall, we have a large concentration of engineers. Uh, this, I, I have to say it because it amuses me every time I talk about it. We actually, I heard in a Chamber of Commerce talk about two years ago, I did not know this was a unit of measure. You're going to have to include this in a homework problem too. Uh, but it turns out that Huntsville has the most engineers per square foot of anywhere in the country. I did not know engineers per square foot was a unit of measure, but apparently it is. I don't know what name we would give that, but uh, we do take a lot of engineers. Uh, but we also, yes, we need accountants. In fact, I just saw an advertisement for a public relations person. Uh, and uh, another one for our, our accounting office uh, about two weeks ago. I saw that on. So the place that you would look for those, a couple of places. One is USA Jobs. Uh, what you do is you look for Pathways Internships. If you're, still, if you're in college, look for Pathways Internships. Set yourself an alert because when we pop up a Pathways opening, it lasts for about three days and then they've got their maximum number and they start looking at the applications. Uh, there are also, you can look at interns.nasa.gov. Uh, that is our short-term internships, single semester, fall, spring, summer semesters, uh, internship program. Uh, as long as you're in college, you can, you're eligible for those internships. And that, they'll actually, that one is for any of the NASA centers. So you look for the one that matches best to you and apply. Uh, so, there, there are ways to come work for us. Anybody who's in this room just about can come work for us. If you get stuck with trying to find any of those, you can email me. My email address is john.f, as in Frederick, dot weis, as in Sam, at nasa.gov. I like giving out that one because I can say at nasa.gov. <laughs>